Hey everyone, me again, Laszlo Montgomery, part four in our little overview series covering the life of John S. Service. Through the life of John Service, we're also looking at some of the history of U.S.-China relations during the time after the capital of nationalist China, the Republic of China, had been moved from Nanjing to Chongqing. As I've mentioned before, I'm using Lynn Joyner's Honorable Survivor, Mao's China, McCarthy's America, and the Persecution of John S. Service. We have traced his life up to this point from his beginnings growing up in Sichuan province, attending school in Shanghai in the 1920s, and then moving back to the U.S. Then, through his lifelong friend, John Patton Davies, he joins the Foreign Service and he arrives in China pretty much just in time for World War II. And it's here where we have been lingering of recent. We are focusing, of course here at the Royal China History Podcast, on the life of John Service. But during this period in wartime China, 1941 to 1945, there are major roles and walk-on parts played by people whose names populate a thousand history books about the time. We left off last time recovering from the aftershocks of Patrick Hurley's outrage after he found out Colonel David Barrett had been wandering around up in Yan'an with a bunch of OSS spooks secretly collaborating with the communists. Mao and Jiang are both enjoying themselves, toying with Hurley, who they have figured out doesn't know anything. Hurley can't figure out what the heck is going on as far as why Mao won't come to the table. But after he finds out, it's because Mao's already sitting at the table, in a manner of speaking, Hurley goes ballistic, and like I said last time in episode 117, heads rolled and blood flowed. So first, Stillwell gets canned, and now there's all this terrible blowback from this incident. Service is not in China when all this is going down in late December 1944. Morale amongst the China hands and those who were like-minded was at an all-time low. The Ichigo Offensive might have put some heat on Allied air bases in China, but now Japan was being hammered from the east by U.S. bombers. Everyone knows Japan's going down. It's just a matter of when. With all this bad karma pervading the U.S. Embassy in Chongqing, John Service returns in January 1945. Now things are going to get very ugly and very personal. January 9th, Zhou Enlai kicks things off by attempting to send a secret message to FDR to hold a tete-a-tete -tete with Mao and himself. Who knows what might have happened if this message had found its mark. FDR never knew about it. And so this one got filed under lost historical opportunities. Of course, this effort on Joe's part was kept secret from Ambassador Hurley. There's a lot of chatter and dialogue going back and forth between the military, the embassy, journalists, various spy agencies, KMT, CCP, and everybody is eavesdropping on everyone. Messages are being intercepted, letters being opened, and of course the censorship in Chongqing was legendary. SACO, remember them, Sino-American Cooperative Organization, sort of a joint venture between the OSS and China's oft referred to Himmler, Dai Li, so we know whose side they rooted for. They intercepted plenty of stuff and ranted Jiang with it. And, and everyone was having a field day feeding Ambassador Hurley all this bogus information to manipulate his ego and sway him in the right direction. At this point, there's no use talking to Patrick Hurley about telling him what a nice guy Mao was. The U.S. ambassador was so tightly inside the pocket of the songs of Jiang and all those considered part of the China lobby. And then suddenly to stir up the pot and kick up some dust, Hurley ran and told FDR that all these military, OSS, and State Department people are all secretly undermining him and preventing him from carrying out FDR's objectives. FDR predictably gets all bent out of shape, so then he yells at General Wedemeyer, you know, who then yells at Hurley for you know, running and telling the boss about this. The atmosphere is really poisonous in Chongqing when Service's flight lands. He flew in with Wild Bill Donovan, who he met up with in New Delhi. He hadn't even unpacked his bags yet when Hurley calls him in and warns him, you know, no doubt with a wagging finger, that, you know, if he tries any of his famous antics, he'll be a dead man walking. He doesn't use those words, but thanks to sufficient cajoling by the secret police, Hurley 
had been by now uh, led to believe that of all these forces working against him, service was the worst of the worst. Now, technically, service is still working for Wedemeyer as a political officer. Remember, General Wedemeyer kept him on after he replaced uh, Stilwell. And Hurley can't dismiss service, but he can make his life difficult. Zhou Enlai uh, had flown into Chongqing on January 24th, 1945, you know, to keep the charade going about trying to work things out. Nobody expected these negotiations to go anywhere. So when they went nowhere, no one was surprised. Zhou left on February 16th and flew back empty-handed to Yan'an. So Ambassador Hurley is really tightening the clamps and is determined to force some kind of settlement between the CCP and KMT. Wedemeyer doesn't want any further trouble with Hurley, so he is making sure the lid is tight in the military. No one is going to be able to get anything out there that conflicted with current USA policy. That still called for sole support of the nationalist government and those guys only. But then U.S. policy suddenly changes when John Carter Vincent at State sends out a contradictory order telling everyone we are not married to the Nationalists and should still consider other options. Then shortly after this comes the Yalta Conference. Jiang is expecting to be treated like the great power that he is, and instead China is sold up the river by the big three. The Soviets would end up controlling Outer Mongolia as well as getting long-term leases at Port Arthur for their navy. Dalian was to be internationalized, which is a fancy way of saying the Russians got to enjoy their own concession there. And the railroads of Manchuria, the lifeblood of the whole northeast China region, were to be managed with the cooperation of the Soviets. Now, all of this was kept secret initially, but the cat gets out of the bag not too soon after. So much for the Cairo conference. Let's go now to the Service Ludden Report. This is going to shake things up once it gets out. Raymond P. Ludden. He was another one of the China hands of this period, along with John Patton Davies and others I've mentioned and not mentioned. Ludden was part of Stilwell's gang of political officers who now, like Jack Service, worked for Wedemeyer. Ludden was also part of the Dixie Mission. His role was to travel around the north of China and validate all these wild claims previously made by service regarding the success of the Chai Coms up there. This is an amazing story. Ludden traveled with six fellow American observers and a Chinese guide all around the north for over a thousand miles. They trekked through the dead of North China's harsh winter all the way to the Japanese military headquarters set up in Baoding in Hebei, about halfway between Beijing and Shijiazhuang, they brought back a treasure trove of info about the real situation up north. So Ludin returned to Yan'an from this long, perilous journey that was, by the way, just one of the many adventures he had in his life. So he comes back and basically corroborates everything Service had been writing about in his report. So General Wedemeyer, who was scheduled to head back to the U.S. with Ambassador Hurley for talks, requests Ludden and Service to write some sort of definitive report that gives the whole situation up there with respect to the communists and the popular support that they were getting. The report, when it was completed and handed to Wedemeyer, outlined the entire case against the nationalists and the kind of detail that Jack Service was famous for. It explained how the CCP had won over the hearts and minds of the local populace in North China. He vehemently called for American military cooperation with the communists in the same way that Churchill had called for support of Tito in Yugoslavia in the fight against the Germans. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The two top guys in Chongqing, Wedemeyer and Hurley, flew to D.C. for talks on February 19th, 1945. This left their deputies in charge, and these two are going to play with matches and burn the whole dang house down. George Atchison, Hurley's deputy, took it upon himself to have this viewpoint expressed in the service Ludden report shared, you know, throughout the halls of power in Washington and, of course, in Chongqing. He and everyone else at the embassy knew Hurley had been whitewashing all the dispatches and was as much of a stooge of the KMT as Hurley claimed that, you know, Jack Service was to the communists. Atchison 
along with Wedemeyer's number two, Brigadier General Mervyn Gross, arranged to send a message to D.C. to broaden the discussion and get the word out about the real situation on the ground in China. They were hoping to force some discussion on the matter rather than do nothing and risk the likelihood that Hurley would monopolize the narrative, not to mention the whole agenda. One didn't have to read too far into the first page to realize this report smelled of John Service's handiwork. Even though he wasn't officially part of state, they still depended on his skills to make the point. But then, like Kane mutineers who had finally had enough, everyone at the embassy personally signed off on the content. It was concluded, quote, This telegram has been drafted with the assistance and agreement of all the political officers of the staff of this embassy and has been shown to General Wedemeyer's chief of staff, General Gross. February 28th, 1945, they let this baby fly. How do you think Hurley is going to react to this? Everyone knew what they were doing, sending such an openly... Contrary viewpoint, blindsiding the boss, forcing him in a corner. But, again, no speed of communication like we have nowadays that could blast that report out. Hurley didn't see it immediately. It first slowly uh, permeated into the halls of the Department of State and then into the press, of course. Meanwhile, the Dixie mission is still not officially over, and in March... A big thing is starting to get organized in Yan'an. A party congress. This is going to be the 7th, the Chita. It's going to be held end of April to mid-June in Yan'an, of course. 544 delegates are going to represent what is now, in early 1945, a CCP that is 1.2 million members strong. It's a pretty big deal. And a draft party constitution is going to be passed, and Mao's thought is, for the first time... Uh, going to be enshrined in this party document. And this is the last party congress until after liberation on October 1st, 1949. So it's a pretty big thing, and John Service gets the okay from George Atchison to go observe the party congress and report back any useful intel. So, March 9th, John Service flies back to Yan'an and is given strict instructions. Don't get sucked into politics. And he's told to keep his mouth shut and don't do anything that contravenes Ambassador Hurley's orders. With all this confusion recently in policy, Atchison figured sending service up there would do more good than harm. So off to Yan'an he went. The welcome service got this time compared to when he first landed in Yan'an last July 1944 was a lot different. Pretty much from Mao on down, everyone had just had it with American duplicity and broken promises. Mao knew all along that there was no way to separate the Americans from the nationalists, but it must have been a bitter pill to swallow when the realization finally came. The Dixie mission would continue mixing with the CCP until July 22nd, 1947, but the whole flavor of the mission had gone sour. And besides, the OSS was mostly running things up there and everyone knows they weren't the best diplomats to have. JX Service got an earful when he went up there. Predictably, they ragged on him again about Patrick Hurley going back on his word on that five-point plan. They beat that dead horse a few more times. And they pretty much let Service know they felt Hurley was more or less Jiang Kai-shek's chief spokesman, and there didn't seem to be any way to reconcile this situation. John Service got plenty of face time with Mao on this trip, and with many of the other leaders, too. He dutifully recorded down all his observations, no doubt anxious to bring all this info back to headquarters. It all came straight from the horse's mouth. Meanwhile, back in D.C., John Carter Vincent is the lucky one who gets to hand a copy of Atchison's report to Hurley, the one that all Chongqing Embassy staff signed off on to show solidarity against the ambassador. Well, Hurley saw red... He called this tantamount to treason and immediately started looking to get even. And good old Hurley, he took one look at this report from the embassy and he knew right away who the black hand was who produced this. Immediately, he seeks retribution and files protests against the entire staff. Hurley made all kinds of protests, but too many people were wise now. And the notion to consider other options besides Jiang Kai-shek, 
was not so easily quashed. FDR continued to do things his way, secretly, without the knowledge of cabinet officials, continuing to use emissaries. This was one of the reasons for a lot of this mistrust. People, no matter which side they were on, were just too tied to their own core beliefs on this one. And whoever supported Jiang, supported Jiang, and no one was going to change their mind. And those who knew what Jack Service knew, well, they might not all agree that Mao was the answer, but they couldn't be swayed in their belief that the KMT definitely wasn't the answer either. March 22nd, the you-know-what hits the fan in a big way when word got out in D.C. that John Service was up in Yen'an again. Inquiries were made at once, and it soon learned that Atchison and Army Headquarters had both okayed this, and in fact insisted to send service as the most logical choice, you know, to go check out what was going on at this upcoming party congress. Well, Hurley was livid, to say the least. First, this high-profile betrayal of his whole staff in Chongqing, signing off on that report like they did. And now, this eternal stone in his boot, this burr in his saddle, John S. Service, was up in Yen'an, no doubt whooping it up with Mao Zedong, who... Hurley, by the way, referred to as moose dung. Now it had all gone too far. Filled with all the self-importance from the Octoritas FDR conferred on him, Hurley started throwing fireballs, and before you know it, Hurley did to service what he did to Stillwell. He started making a ruckus and calling in all his favors and made his grand case against all those traitors who had been secretly undermining him all along. Eight days later, service is told to get himself back to Chongqing. He left Yan'an on April 4th, 1945. He had spent quite a bit of time with Mao, Zhou, and all the leaders discussing the American and Chinese positions. But when John Service got on that plane and left Yan'an, the next time anyone would be talking Turkey with Mao and Zhou would be more than a quarter century later when Henry Kissinger snuck out of Pakistan to meet with Zhou Enlai in Beijing in 1971. That was it. When Jack Service's plane took off, there were no more serious discussions. It was effectively over. Service was being chased out of there by his government and told not to talk to those guys anymore. Once Service arrived in Chongqing, he was told he was being sent back to the States for reassignment somewhere in the State Department. As far as China went and this war and all these negotiations and diplomacy with the KMT and CCP, those days were over for him. So he left China. Jack Service didn't go back for a very long time, about 30 years. He thought he was going back to Washington where he would be warmly welcomed, uh, you know, to talk some sense to all those who hadn't yet seen the light. No one briefed him yet on how noxious the fumes were in Washington with respect to the whole matter of China policy. John S. Service, when he returned to the U.S. in April of 1945, thought he was just going in for the usual consultations, and he was anxious to tell what he alone knew after all these private meetings with Mao and the other leaders. Instead, he was going to be run through the ringer, have his career ruined, his reputation, everything. Patrick Hurley and all those who supported the powerful China lobby in the U.S. were going to put John's service through an unimaginable amount of personal and professional pain. He was in Patrick Hurley's gun sights now. Hurley had gotten rid of Stillwell. He had caused John Patton Davies to be transferred out of China. He had ruined Colonel David Barrett's promotion and had him transferred out of China as well. And his staff in Chongqing, who bravely signed their name to the report sent to Washington based on the service Ludden findings, they all got whacked too for daring to challenge their boss's point of view. Now another one who Hurley didn't see eye to eye with was going to get beheaded by the ambassador. When Hurley was on his way back to China, he ran into Wild Bill Donovan and was told by the OSS head that John Carter Vincent was suspected of passing on sensitive documents to a journalist who shared them with spies from the Soviet Union. Ha, gotcha. John Carter Vincent, being high up and all in the State Department, had always been sort of untouchable to Hurley. Now with Donovan's tip-off, He'd get him later. So Hurley flew back to China via London and Moscow. He was filling the Allied leaders in on the latest in Chongqing and that he was going to go down 
and sit with the CCP and KMT and bring these guys together once and for all. Despite everything learned to the contrary, Hurley still believed he could do it. So, Jack's service arrives in Washington just in time for FDR to feel that sharp pain in the back of his head that signaled his death on April 12th, 1945. Mao Zedong sent his condolences through General Wedemeyer's office. Okay, so Roosevelt dies. Stalin does this little thing that he does and goes and smashes and grabs what he wants. He knows no one could stop him and saw the U.S. was a bit shell-shocked after losing FDR. And, and worst of all, perhaps, was that this great and charismatic leader who so shaped the destiny of 20th century America was suddenly gone. And in his place was an untested former haberdasher turned politician from a Midwestern state that most pronounced Missouri, but the new president pronounced Missouri, like Professor Bob. Truman, by the way, was so new on the job, and although he was the vice president, in the short time that he had been serving, just a few months only, FDR had never had a sit-down with him to discuss the war, the peace, foreign policy, Russia, China. Truman just walked in cold. So every one of my ancient demographic who remembers the Cold War years can see it all starting to happen just about now. There's not much the U.S. can do in 1945 to push back on Stalin. So right away, not that there was a whole heck of a lot of trust to begin with, the U.S. and Soviets are already circling their wagons, and it'll be like this, of course, for the next 30 years or so. So, service hits town just as Roosevelt dies, and the first one he sees are Vincent and Lachlan Curry. Service spills his guts about everything he saw and heard up in Yen An. No need to rehash what the main points were he was trying to convey. He insisted now was the crucial moment. The U.S. either found some way to fit the CCP into its foreign policy, or we just watch this one walk out the door and face the consequences. So Hurley, you know, rode off into the sunset back to China to save the day and bring the CCP and KMT together in a happy, cozy coalition government, allied to the USA, of course. At the same time, services running around D.C. like Chicken Little, spreading this message about the sky falling unless we face up to the realities going on right at the moment in China. Both Vincent and Curry hooked service up with all kinds of reporters and government people, hoping that having someone with first-hand knowledge of the situation up in China might have more street cred. And here is where I'm going to sort of, well, not really end our saga, but sort of pick up the pace and zoom out to give you the big picture. But half of Lynn Joyner's book on John's service deals with his life in China. We've now covered all that. The second part concerns what happens to service after he fell into the sausage grinding machine that combined Washington politics and the Red Scare that was soon going to start to ramp up. So I will encourage you all, once again, if you want to read some fascinating stuff on those crazy, paranoid Cold War days in the 1950s, Lynn Joyner delivers it up. It's a very confusing and complicated tale filled with all kinds of journalists and lawyers, FBI types, you know, including J. Edgar Hoover, uh, spooks from the OSS, ONI and the KGB, pro jung anti jung people, Washington people, spies, and more turncoats than you could shake a stick at. And then into all this came Joe McCarthy to sort it all out, and half a century after it happened, we're still discussing and analyzing the rubble of what the McCarthy hearings left behind. So John's service got dragged by his ankles through all of what went down in Washington in the late 40s and into the early 50s. Back in those bad old days, the FBI sort of didn't pay as much attention to the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution as they do today. So everyone and their mother who was suspect were being illegally surveilled by the FBI. They had bugs everywhere. They had agents checking out Jack's service constantly. His phone calls, his private conversations in restaurants, his mail, what he kept in his drawers and his desk, and, and of course, you know, who he met with. And that was the problem. And that's what sunk Jack's service. A week after he hits town, he meets with a guy named Philip Jaffe. Jaffe was one of the founders of a left-leaning magazine called Amerasia. A bunch of people are going to go down in flames for their association with Jaffe. Amerasia magazine pushed the 
communist agenda, and were sympathetic to the cause of worldwide communism. So naturally, this put them on the radar, and Jaffe, being a known communist to the FBI, was always kept under close surveillance. When Jack Service met with Philip Jaffe, he didn't know that he was really putting himself in harm's way. Service and a lot of others, too, were, how shall we say, a little bit too trusting with the sensitive information they had in their possession. And that's the crux of the whole mess that followed. Lynn Joyner goes into plenty of detail in her book how all this went down. Poor John Service walked into more traps than anyone I have ever heard of. He really was his own worst enemy. Hey, baby, loose lips sink ships. So the U.S. government puts all the resources of the Justice Department to go after Amerasia for all these articles they have been publishing based on materials that were highly classified. So the FBI took them down. Jack Service, too. Hey, his reports were found inside Amerasia's offices. How did those guys get it? All sorts in the government and military were leaking info to Amerasia and in the political climate at the time. This couldn't go on for too long without something happening. At the same time that Jack Service was getting ready to be taken down, General Wedemeyer sent a letter of commendation to the Secretary of State, who you know stayed on after Truman took over. He gave Service quite an endorsement. So he still had a lot of support from many lofty characters in the government and military. But on June 6th, 1945, that was the end for John S. Service. The FBI arrested him along with Philip Jaffe and four others. As far as Service's role in what became known as the Amerasia Affair, what they found was a lot of negligence on his part in handing out a lot of documents that were still classified. At worst, he was stupid and trusting of these guys like Jaffe. But he did what he did, and the Justice Department was going to show these commie sympathizers what happens when you root for the wrong team. Well, too bad for the FBI. The grand jury decided not to indict service. Maybe he was careless and shouldn't have been so free with his many reports from the front lines in China. He passed this stuff out to people he shouldn't have and got caught. But he wasn't passing this stuff to any foreign governments or anything that serious. Jaffe and two others ended up with indictments. But, you know, like it happened sometimes, the case was bungled due to certain legal complications related to the FBI getting caught scraping the Fourth Amendment off the bottom of its shoe. So the three defendants in the Amerasia affair got off easy. Although, of course, you know, everyone knew from that point on to stay away from them. But the Amerasia affair was going to have a big impact on John Service's life. What this affair did was raise a red flag about the seriousness of communist infiltration in this country and that it even permeated the halls of the State Department. And this directly led to you know, the whole Joe McCarthy thing that is almost universally looked back on as one of the darkest moments in modern American history. So Lynn Joyner's narrative about how all these communists and communist sympathizers and dupes like Jack Service, who all became entangled in this web of intrigue and revenge, is you know, it's just beautiful. Even in 2013, post 9-11, you know, with the Patriot Act and everything, reading all this and taking in the brazenness of the FBI and the intelligence services, really an eye-opener. People were tracked down and destroyed back then in the 1940s, just as they are today. The only difference I can see is all the fancy technologies we have today. And service's main tormentor, Patrick Hurley, now that he had service where he wanted him, he piled on too. In all his reports and communications, he never missed a chance to spread most of the blame for his failures on the countermeasures taken by service. So he really did his best to blame all these China hands, but he seemed to reserve his greatest vitriol for John S. Service. And if you read some of the statements made by Service in private correspondence, the feelings were pretty much mutual. But the pendulum always swings both ways, and Hurley's 15 minutes were just about up. By now, everyone was wise to him, and his benefactor, FDR, was already gone with the ages. And after all this time, saying, I'm going to bring Jiang and Mao together, you know, they were finally demanding to know where was that beef. 
By May of 1945, Hurley was under fire, mostly due to his own big mouth and tendency to overpromise. What he had done to the popular General Stilwell didn't win him a lot of admiration in the military. When he fired every staff member who signed that embassy memo that was based on the info learned from the service Ludden report, trust me, plenty of people in the Foggy Bottom community were grumbling. Patrick Hurley wasn't so invincible anymore. So service drops headfirst into the maw of the prosecutorial gears of the Justice Department. No less a personage than J. Edgar Hoover himself was watching this case with daily interest. But service had friends in high places, and Tommy Corcoran, yes, Tommy the Cork, we mentioned him in part one, he's back, and he gets a little ham-fisted in the manner he pulls all the strings, but he gets service off the hook in August that same year, right around the time of the atomic bombings of Japan. How Tommy the Cork pulled all those strings, again, fascinating reading about 1940s D.C. politics and lobbying, I'm not going to say too much more about China and what happened after Jack's service left Yan'an in April. By August, no one needed an abundance of brain cells to know civil war was not only coming, it was already underway. This is going to be what we look at next here at the uh, Royal China History Podcast. So, everything going on in China, from Japan's surrender to liberation, sort of like a romance of the two kingdoms, that whole epic is coming next. After service was cleared in the Amerasia case, he went back to work at the State Department. Now the true era began of the Red Scare. 1948, it started to ramp up. And after Mao emerged victorious in late 1949, and after he said he would lean towards Stalin's direction, that's when it all exploded like a supernova. The stage was set for the House Un-American Activities Committee. This excellent piece of political theater, inspiration for so many great Hollywood movies, began in August of 1948. Hey man, everything John Service and all his ilk had been saying for so long finally happened. And there had to be some scapegoats hung out to blame for this. You see, the big deal back then, after the PRC was established and during the lead-up to the Korean War, the chorus in Washington was quite shrill in demanding to find out who was to blame for losing China. We lost China. But if we, meaning the USA, lost China, then that would sort of mean it was ours to begin with. What did we have? What did we lose? The American public, well, <laughs> they were just chowing down on the Red Scare, you know, propaganda. This was, you know, going to be a whole new industry. Red Dawn wasn't built in a day. Service helped write a white paper that was supposed to be the final word on what happened in China. It came out in August 1949. And rather than serve as something constructive, the whole thing exploded in the face of the Truman administration. The China lobby in the U.S. was not to be taken lightly, and they fought back hard against any anti-KMT literature. The soft spot had always been the Amerasia magazine case and how Service got off scot-free, and the other ones involved in the scandal, shady characters all, got off with a slap on the wrist. So the magnificent and always reliable Washington political dredging industry pulled this one up off the bottom of the Potomac, and by changing the narrative once again, service was back in the spotlight. Once the Taiwan problem officially came into being following the founding of the PRC, it added a whole and totally unexpected dynamic to the state of affairs between the U.S. and China. Wow, what do you do now? Gee, who saw that one coming? January 1950, Truman tells all Yanks, get out of China. Jiang and the entire China lobby were pulling out all the stops to make sure we stuck with the KMT, even though they were sort of, you know, in this temporary political predicament that's you know still going on, by the way. It didn't take long before the American 7th Fleet was sailing back and forth along the Taiwan Strait. February 9th, 1950, Joe McCarthy gave his famous speech in West Virginia with a list of 205 names and were off and running. Hoover and McCarthy joined forces, and I bet you can guess who the first guy they fingered. Yes, our hero, John S. Service. He was the 
first of the known communist agents operating inside the State Department. So, service was serving in Calcutta at that moment, was about to get put through the ringer again. He's now front page news and he's getting a ton of shine on him. His friends and allies all embrace him, but the year 1950 is a dark one for anyone considered a China hand. By the end of May, service was going through these loyalty hearings at the State Department's new Loyalty Security Board. The charge against service went like this. You are a member or in sympathetic association with the Communist Party, which has been designated by the Attorney General as an organization which seeks to alter the form of government of the United States by unconstitutional means. And further that, you are a person who has habitual or close associations with persons known or believed to be in that category, to an extent which would justify the conclusion that you might, through such an association, voluntarily or involuntarily divulge classified information without authority. Well, I suppose you could say that, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Did it hurt the government in Service's case, or didn't it? Anyway, July 20th, 1950, Service's name is cleared, and McCarthy gets a kick in the teeth. But wait, McCarthy makes a comeback in the midterms, and before the champagne is finished, Service is once again hauled in front of the loyalty hearings with a, all new kinds of evidence dredged up, attesting to his unswerving support of the Chai Khans. By November 1st of that year, Chinese and American soldiers were killing each other on the frozen Korean Peninsula. You can't imagine what this was doing to the whole firestorm of communist hysteria that was raging across the U.S. How much worse could this get? For Jack Service, it got pretty bad. December 13, 1951, the verdict was given in his loyalty hearing. It was determined that, quote, based on the intentional and unauthorized disclosure of documents and information of a confidential and non-public character, unquote, there was a reasonable doubt in the case of Service's loyalty. So he got kicked out of the State Department. By 1952, John Service was selling steam traps in Mexico for $9,000 a year for a company named Sarco International. The McCarthy witch hunts were in full swing. October 31st of that year, Service's lawyer filed a lawsuit against the government to clear his name. And five years later, on June 17, 1957, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a unanimous vote, did just that. The following month, the State Department was ordered to hire Jack Service back. But it wasn't what you'd call much of a career by then. After all that he had been a part of from 1941 to 1945, to have it all come down to this was just too much for John Service. He retired from the Foreign Service in May of 1962. He was not quite 53 years old. What did he do? Service ended up being a lecturer and permanent fixture at UC Berkeley. And he was in Berkeley when news of Kissinger's secret visit to China came in 1971, and China mania began. Suddenly, Jack Service was back in the public spotlight, but this time in a good way. And the whole wretched story of his persecution was told, but this time in the context of Nixon's impending visit to China. So a bad thing, now was suddenly a good thing. And on September 1971, John S. Service, on the invitation of Premier Zhou Enlai, landed in Beijing with his wife, Carolyn. Despite the Lin Biao incident that had just happened, it was a time of happy reunions, and he traveled around to Shanghai and to Yan'an and to his birthplace in Chengdu. And there in Chengdu, he saw his boyhood home and the YMCA his father had established, both still there, although it wasn't a Y anymore. He happened to be in China when Kissinger was there working out the details of Nixon's upcoming visit in February 72. Kissinger eagerly sought out John Service and was the beneficiary of a little inside info about how these Chinese leaders looked at things, especially the matter of Taiwan. Kissinger was quite thankful for the advice and later invited Service to visit Nixon and him at the Western White House in San Clemente, about 90 minutes away from where I now sit. Before Service left China for the U.S., uh, he had a long sit-down with Premier Zhou, and they talked of old times, of course, and the dramas they shared in Chongqing and Yan'an. It was different now to talk about those days from a 
1970s perspective than back in 1944. Jack's service went back to America in 71 with China mania really ramping up. Ping pong diplomacy had already happened. He got some more shine on him and was eagerly sought out for TV shows and magazine stories. After all, he knew Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai. So for the remaining years of his life, Jack Service got to trade on his good name that had been fully restored. Nobody listened to him back in Chongqing in 1943, 1944. What is there to say except this is just another one of those what-ifs that we'll never know the answer to. More than two decades of friendship lost between the U.S. and China. And all the good that might have come out of that. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Red Scare, McCarthy, the Cold War, not to mention Mao's excesses. Everything might have turned out differently. If the U.S. had embraced the PRC in 49 rather than 1979, who knows if things might have been better. Better for who? Who knows? Didn't turn out that way. Service went back to China a few more times, one of those times to trace the footsteps of the Long March with Harrison Salisbury, who produced a best-selling book about the journey in his 1985 work, The Long March, The Untold Story. John Service passed away quietly on February 3rd, 1999, at the ripe old age of 89. He lived out his remaining years associated with UC Berkeley, where my daughter attends now. His obituary in the New York Times went like this, quote, John S. Service, the first of the old China hands purged from the State Department in the McCarthy era, died yesterday in Oakland, California. He was 89. As a young foreign officer in World War II, he filed prescient reports on the rival forces battling the occupying Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and Mao Zedong's communists and observed the corruption and weakness of the former. But after the war, as what became known as the China lobby, swung American policy strongly behind the failing Jiang government, the communists gained full control of the mainland in 1949, driving the nationalists to Taiwan. Much of the blame fell on what was said at the time to be a pro-Soviet conspiracy in the State Department. Who lost China? became a major election slogan that shaped American political life for many years. It helped make the careers of Joseph R. McCarthy and Richard M. Nixon, and, according to some historians, helped shape American involvement in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Unquote. He got all the respect that he deserved. He had his detractors, and of course he was never able to fully shake off the taint of the Amerasia affair. But as the years go by the lens of history becomes more and more focused. And John Stewart's service, though maligned in his own day, was truly one of the greatest China hands of the 20th century and maybe sort of a patron saint to all American China hands who are out there in the trenches today playing their collective small parts in building strong U.S.-China relations. I'm sure you're all wondering whatever happened to Patrick Hurley. He sent in his resignation to President Truman on November 26, 1945. He clung to the belief that he had been wronged and blamed all those who worked against him. I was going to read excerpts of his resignation letter because it's really a doozy. But we're well into stoppage time again and I have to tie up all these loose ends yet. He remained a Republican stalwart for the rest of his days and... He ran for the Senate three times from his home state of New Mexico, but lost each time. He got into the uranium mining business in the 1950s and died on July 30th, 1963, at the age of 80. So, that's it. We did it in four parts. John Service, ladies and gentlemen. I did not include any of the details of John Service's family life, his marriage, or his you know, personal life. Go read the book. He was an interesting guy, and I hope in these past four episodes you have an idea who he was and uh, of the times he lived in. Thanks for hanging in there if you made it this far. I hope you enjoyed this story. Next time when we convene, I am going to start a series on the Chinese Civil War, 1945-1949. I'll pick up right about the time when John Service left Yan'an for the last time and things really 
began to fly off the rails. This topic, of course, has always been on the list since day one, but Barry and Beijing gave me the idea to do this one, and hey, perfect timing, too. I got a big invasion from Ningbo coming next week. Not going to have much time for the China History Podcast, I'm afraid. So, episode 119 on the Chinese Civil War Part 1 might be a while. I hope no one will hold me in too much contempt over that. Hey, Tuesday morning, May 28th, everyone. I'm going to be doing an IAMA on Reddit in the History subreddit. I'll be tweeting details of that as the date approaches. The September trip to Beijing, still on. Looking forward to meeting a lot of my favorite expats there to thank them personally for all the free info I glom off them and their blogs. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny and gorgeous Claremont, California. Take care all and I'll see you next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.